Our climate is changing. The world is warming. Sea levels are rising faster than ever. And extreme weather is becoming more frequent and more intense. The science is clear. Human actions are to blame. Climate change is the defining crisis of our time. We are in a climate emergency. I spent most of my career trying to measure the climate impacts of our actions in the hopes that governments can identify the best policies or businesses can find the right strategies to help us slow the damage. Since the Industrial Revolution, the world learned to produce everything faster and cheaper. As societies got richer, we produced more and consumed more energy, more materials, and more food. What we need is a new industrial revolution, a new playbook that decouples growth from emissions. That revolution is gaining momentum. Our carbon footprints are larger than we realize. From the buildings we live in to all the things we surround our lives with, everything is embedded with carbon emissions. At the rate we're consuming and producing our materials, we are headed for a climate emergency. Plastic, a wonder material that changed manufacturing forever and revolutionized the global economy. Durable, light, and used in practically everything. The problem is, producing it is very carbon intensive. Plastic is made from crude oil. It's processed into monomers like ethylene, then polymerized into polyethylene, which then becomes plastic pellets. They're then melted and molded to make products. As much as 8% of the world's total oil supply is used to make plastic. And producing or incinerating plastics produces 850 million metric tons of greenhouse gases a year. That's equal to 180 coal-fired power plants. Up to four to 8% of all plastic is recycled. And when it isn't disposed correctly, it pollutes the environment and even harms our food supply. We want to make sure that we have the right and the most advanced technologies in place to ensure that the plastic waste is being recycled, therefore contributing to a circular economy. The Alliance to End Plastic Waste works with venture capitalists, financial institutions, and private investors to channel much needed funds into research on new technologies to end the world's problems with plastic waste. The value of the plastic waste that enters the environment ends up in open dump fields or in incineration today or in landfills for that matter, has a value estimated of between 80 and 120 billion dollars. A value that today is lost, but doesn't have to be lost. One of the Alliance's many partners is CRDC, the Center for Regenerative Design and Collaboration. In Costa Rica, the company collects all types of plastic waste and converts it into a high-value concrete modifier that's used in making a new type of concrete. We can show a real working example of the circular economy, one that'll make a difference not only to this country, but around the world. We're going to be converting 90 tons a day of waste plastic that no one wanted and in fact had a negative value. That negative value we're going to convert into appreciating assets that will make a real difference to infrastructure and the community. Plastic waste of all sorts is collected. This plastic is shredded into small pieces and batched by density. It is then preconditioned with a special mix of mineral additives before being sent to a heat extruder. Subsequently, this mixture is cooled and granulated into fine particles, and resin-8 is born. Resin-8 can be added to a wide variety of structural concrete products to either decrease weight, increase strength, or even provide better insulation and acoustics. We've been able to open in South Africa and in Hong Kong, in the United States. People understand that we need to make a change. We need to make a change specifically in this plastic problem. While recycling picks up speed, new research into more sustainable substitutes for plastic is underway. RWDC produces Solon, a raw material that could be used to replace plastics in some products. 
Solon is a biologically benign material made from plant-based oils, like used cooking oil. The used cooking oil is converted to a type of polymer called PHA by microbes during fermentation. When fermentation is complete, the PHA is separated and compounded into a resin. These PHA resins are used as a drop-in replacement for traditional petroleum-based resins to make single-use articles people use every day. And as we examine every known living system, we find the same thing, that PHA is made and utilized in nature and it's ubiquitous. So everywhere we look, we find PHA. Because it's a natural material, Solon is biodegradable when it's placed in landfills. It also has a fraction of the carbon footprint compared to regular plastic. When it's done being used, a product made from Solon gets a second life. We can use it to recycle and remake an article. We can use it to make other articles different than what it was originally, or we can use it in a composting scenario where it then becomes organic matter that we can use for growing food crops. We can also use it as animal food. So the end result of an article made with Solon can be a wide array of possibilities and it gives us options that we don't have with other materials. Plastics aren't our only obsession that's costing the earth. There's also clothes. Textiles are the second largest polluter in the world, producing 10% of global carbon emissions and nearly 20% of wastewater. The fashion industry sucks up more energy than the aviation and shipping sectors combined. Consider the life cycle of clothes, from growing cotton in the fields, to processing it into threads, then fabric, and finally into a piece of clothing. The clothes also need to be stored and then distributed, so there's carbon emitted at every step. And then they quickly add up because everyone buys clothes and we're buying them more often. Clothes also need to be washed and ironed and often disposed. Clothes produce up to 10% of the world's global carbon emissions, and more than 80% of all clothing finally ends up in landfills or incinerators, which also release carbon emissions. Scientists are now learning new and more efficient ways to produce clothes. Lanzatech has a circular economy approach using waste as a resource. It's diverting flue gases from smokestacks. A bacteria ingests the gases and turns it into ethanol through a process of fermentation. Ethanol then becomes the building block for a range of products, clothes included, that would have been produced with petroleum. The way to think about ethanol is to really think about ethylene. Today we use ethylene that's made from petrochemicals and it is converted to everything you use in your daily life. Polyethylene for bottles, polyester for your clothes. All we've done is we've made ethanol, make that ethanol into ethylene, and then that ethylene is exactly like a petroethylene and it can be used to make everything we use in our daily lives. Lanzatech is scaling up its impact by working with mainstream consumer brands, eager to reduce their products' carbon footprints. When we make something like polyester or plastic, we're reducing emissions at least by 75% and often 100%, because what you're doing is you're trapping these gases that would have been pollution in an actual durable good, like clothing. So there's a significant reduction. As more people get better quality of life, they'll start to buy more things. We don't want those things to come from fresh fossil carbon. And so that's what we're trying to show is that these things are possible and that there is a future where we can decouple our fossil life from our everyday life. That decoupling is gaining momentum. About 75% of all clothes contain cotton that involves farming, which is highly resource and carbon intensive. This American startup has developed a much more efficient process. It makes cotton grown from cells in a lab. It's faster and more efficient because we don't have to grow the whole cotton plant. So if you go to the field, it will take 180 days 
to grow the whole cotton and 120 only to grow the plant. So what we do is we leapfrog the process by growing from a single cell directly to the cotton fiber. Galley's approach demonstrates many advantages of growing cotton this way. It's grown all year round in a controlled setting, so production cycles are consistent, regardless of the weather outside. Perfect for supply chain management. Less land is needed, and the process uses just 15% of water required to grow cotton in a field. That's a billion liters of water that gets saved for every 1,000 tons of cotton produced. There are savings on carbon emissions too. So in terms of CO2, the production of cotton today requires 220 million metric tons every year. So this corresponds to approximately a car driving the entire earth three times. So in our process, it's carbon neutral. While cotton gets a makeover, new technologies are being developed to make a different kind of leather. These leather products are made not from the hide of animals, but from mycelium, a fungal thread that's found deep underground. Mycelium are nature's recyclers. They take things that are waste products, dead trees, plants, bugs, old mushrooms, and biodegrade them and turn them into new mushrooms and new mycelium. And this is in contrast to leather where you raise a cow intentionally for the meat for two or three years or for the milk and then uh, take that cow to slaughter and have a hide. Mycelium is grown in under two weeks using Bolt Thread's approach. It is processed to make Milo, Bolt's patented name for the fabric it produces. It looks and feels like leather, but does away with greenhouse gas emissions associated with raising livestock. Milo is now being used by some of the world's biggest fashion brands. A huge swath of consumers look at this planet and watch climate change ravaging much of what we know and love. And they want to put their dollars and their purchasing decisions to work in a way that's helpful, not harmful. And what we find is that brands are eager to adopt sustainable alternative materials for the roughly 100 billion units of apparel we make on this planet every year and move them to something more sustainable. Another leather-like product that's also been commercialized is Pinatex. It's made of waste in pineapple farms. Pineapple leaves are typically burned after the fruits are harvested. Those leaves are now spared and used as feedstock to produce Pinatex. To give you an example, in 2020, we actually used 825 tons of pineapple leaf waste, and that is an equivalent of 264 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent not being released into the atmosphere. And very concretely, that represents about the um, emission used by, um, if you charge, 33 million smartphones. It's not just an ecological solution. The approach is good for business and communities too. Our motto, uh, people, planet and profit, is really in our core DNA. The triple impact, economic impact, social impact by creating new jobs and opportunities, and an environmental impact by obviously reducing a carbon footprint is really at the heart of, of all the decisions we make is the core business model we, we work on. Clothes, bags, and plastics are getting less wasteful. What about whole cities? As societies get richer, cities develop. Construction may be good for economies, but it's one of the biggest culprits of climate change. Much of the sector's carbon emissions come from cement production. Cement is the stuff that holds concrete together. Half of the emissions produced come from producing the heat required for the production process. The other half comes from just using limestone, the key feedstock for making cement. Limestone is calcium carbonate. When it's heated, 44% of its waste is released as CO2. Altogether, for every ton of cement produced, almost a ton of CO2 gets released. Cement is the second most consumed thing on Earth behind water. There's four billion tons of it produced a year. So when you take just the amount of CO2, 0.8 tons of CO2 per cement produced, and the fact that it's 4 billion tons per year, it's clear why that leads to 8% of the world's CO2 emissions coming from cement production. At a plant in California, CO2 emitted as exhaust from the cement manufacturing process 
is converted into a material that works just like cement. We really took our cues or our inspiration from nature. So the same way coral reefs form in nature and how shells form in nature, instead of emitting CO2, they're actually taking CO2, absorbing it and creating a reactive form of limestone. If you talk specifically about our process, we're taking that same feedstock of limestone, we're putting it through a kiln, we're emitting CO2, but then we're recapturing that CO2 to make this form of reactive limestone. And we've engineered it in a way that it can be used both as a partial replacement to existing Portland cement or as a 100% standalone cement. It's a bolt-on process, which means cement producers don't need to make any upstream changes to their feedstocks, machinery, systems and processes, which they've already invested heavily in. It makes the technology easily adoptable and scalable. Another company in Canada also sees CO2 not as a waste, but as a resource. Svante designed a proprietary filter system that traps CO2 from high polluting plants, such as cement, limestone, and hydrogen. CO2 produced from cement manufacturing is typically released through smokestacks. Savante's technology captures the CO2 before it's released into the atmosphere. This is how it works. The flue gas is diverted to a rotating system where carbon dioxide is trapped by Svante's nanofilters. When the filter is saturated, the CO2 is released for storage. The CO2 can then be part of cement manufacturing for carbon-cured concrete or safely stored underground. Savante says each of their plants can capture a million tons of CO2 in a year, and at a cost that's half of other conventional carbon capture technologies. Part of the challenge for smaller players in industry is that it's very difficult for them to adopt new uh, CO2 capture technology. So it's really important that Svante is developing a solution that is simpler, less complex, and less expensive. So that smaller players and smaller manufacturing plants or smaller emitters can adopt the technology and it can be a, a wide, widely adopted globally. In Singapore, sustainable building materials are being applied on an unprecedented scale. The city's Tuas Megaport uses a material called ground granulated blast furnace slag, a byproduct of steel production. The process reduces cement use by 75%. The project uses 5 million cubic meters, about 2,000 Olympic sized swimming pools worth of carbon cured concrete embodied with CO2 that was captured from the concrete manufacturing process. So just imagine the scale of this project. But what's important is that it will save us 1.3 million tons of CO2. And that is equivalent to removing 260,000 petrol cars from the roads permanently. A lot of people think that it will cost an arm and leg to use green materials. But what we have proven is that we can do this safely, reliably at this scale, maybe at a marginal cost escalation. And that's a very important signal to the industry that it is time now to embrace the use of green materials. We've arrived at the dawn of a new industrial revolution, where waste becomes resource, where materials get a valuable second life or as many lives as possible, and where they are created much more efficiently. The stage is now set to inspire greater adoption and more innovation to help sustain all our material needs for generations to come.